All right, I want to do a study today to answer the question, is it possible to defeat lust without getting married? For a single person, in other words, uh, be they male or female, a saved brother or sister in the Lord. If you have lust issues, is it possible to fight that, to defeat that without getting married? Let's look at, look at what the scriptures say. 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verses 1 through 9. Now concerning the things whereof ye wrote unto me, it is good for a man not to touch a woman. Nevertheless, to avoid fornication, let every man have his own wife, and let every woman have her own husband. Let the husband render unto the wife due benevolence, and likewise also the husband, or the, the wife unto the husband. The wife hath not power of her own body, but the husband, and likewise also the husband hath not power of his own body, but the wife. Defraud ye not one the other, except it be with consent for a time, that ye may give yourselves to fasting and prayer, and come together again, that Satan tempt you not for your incontinency. But I speak this by permission, and not of commandment. But I would that all men were even as I myself. But every man hath his proper gift of God, one after this manner, and another after that. I say, say therefore to the unmarried and widows, It is good for them if they abide even as I. But if they cannot contain, let them marry, for it is better to marry than to burn. All right, now you see very simply there, there is no forced commandment in the New Testament to stay celibate, like the Catholics. <laughs> um, that, that's not in Scripture. But on the other hand, there's no forced commandment to get married. It's up to individual choice. If you can be single and not have a problem with lust, then okay. So there has to be a way to be single and take care of lust. All right? Um, and we'll look about that in this study. But if you are single and you have a problem with lust, uh, then you should get married. And marriage will do a number of things to you. Marriage is not just a way of, okay, all the free intimacy you want in bed. No, that's not it. Marriage will make you more responsible as a man. It's a great thing for a man who messes around with video games and has struggles with that and with pornography and whatever else and lust issues. You get married and all of a sudden, hey, there's a wife and now there's children to take care of. You know, no more time for video games. All right, no more time for messing around with lust and get out there and work. You have to work hard as a married man. It's a good thing for you. It gives you responsibility, somebody else to take care of. That's a great thing. A lot of men need that. Okay, but what if you're single and you're saying, okay, there's nobody right now that would work for me. There's nobody that's, you know, anywhere even close to being a biblical wife or husband or whatever. Um, but I'm having some lust issues here. So what do I do? Does God want me to stay single and just get control of this lust? Or, you know, what do I do? Do I just get control of the lust until I eventually find that right person to marry? That's what this study is about. Go down to verse 29 in the same chapter. 1 Corinthians chapter 7 and verse 29 through 35. But this I say, brethren, the time is short. It remaineth that both they that have wives be as though they had none, and they that weep as though they wept not, and they that rejoice as though they rejoiced not, and they that buy as though they possessed not, and they that use this world as not abusing it, for the fashion of this world passeth away. Okay? So you say, well, see, there you go. If you're married, you should act like you're single. There's, you know, time's short. You know, you know and, and it's not, Paul was not saying that the imminency of the rapture or something in his day. No, that's not what he's saying. He's just saying the time is short that we have in life before you go and you die and you go to be with the Lord. That's what he's saying. You don't have a whole lot of time to mess around. Don't spend, you know, the first 36 years of your life playing video games as a single guy. Okay, like I did, uh, you know, before you finally make the decision to get married and whatever else and things. And I could have done a lot more to be more successful in life. That was a terrible way to waste my life away for many years. So I speak with authority on that issue. Uh, the time is short, brethren. When you get saved, you have to realize, hey, redeeming the time because the days are evil. I'm supposed to go out there and work for the Lord. My eternity is based on what I do in this life. And if I fool around and mess around and whatever else, uh, I'm wasting my time. 
right? That's what it's talking about there. It's not saying if you're married, just forsake your wife and go out and, you know, you should be at home and you should have a job and whatever else uh, to provide for your wife and your children. But, you know, because the time is short, you better just get out there and preach the gospel and pass out gospel tracts all day and don't worry about a job. There's some of these guys that into the street preaching and whatever else, and they'll get into that type of thing where they'll actually go out and they will actually say, you know, I'm not going to provide for my wife or whatever. And they'll go out and they'll live this life where they're not providing for their own. All right. You have to watch out for that type of a thing. And, you know, I cannot, you know, when I start preaching about things like this and I think, okay, and then here's where my enemies will come in and they'll say, well, it's what you're doing. Uh, no, actually, this land that I bought because of hard work, um, my wife and my son are actually overworking, uh, trimming trees and things and, and whatnot in the one trail that we have, that we built as a family. Um, we are picking apples right now. We're doing a lot of fun things here. Um, See, so you can provide for your own by having a really good high-paying job and buying whatever's needed, or you can provide for your own by living a simple country life and saying, okay, instead of just turning up a thermostat in the winter, we're actually going to be out doing firewood, teach my son some skills and things like that. That's what I've chosen. All right. So, you know, if you, I mean, for my enemies, it doesn't matter what I say, they still attack me. So, you know, go ahead, make your videos and live streams and whatnot. But uh, getting back to our passage here, verse 32, 1 Corinthians 7, 32 but I would have you without carefulness. He that is unmarried careth for the things that belong to the Lord, how he may please the Lord. If you're single, well then, okay, praise God. That's a good thing. Do something to please the Lord with your time, your free time. Verse 33, but he that is married careth for the things that are of the world, how he may please his wife. Is it condemned there? No, I'm supposed to provide for my own. I'm supposed to go on and take a little vacation day or take my wife out on a date day or whatever else and things. And Oh, there's some neat things to go check out. What's it have to do with serving the Lord? Why are you wasting your time? Because I'm supposed to care for the things of the world, how I may please my wife. Did you forget what 1 Corinthians chapter 7, the first nine verses is all about? Talking about, you know, it's a good thing to have a wife, you know. It's not condemned. Verse 34, there is a difference also between a wife and a virgin. The unmarried woman careth for the things of the Lord, that she may be holy both in body and in spirit. But she that is married careth for the things of the world, how she may please her husband. Yeah. You know, I love it when uh, my wife bakes some special thing for me. I'm working, doing something else, and, and uh, her and my son, they, they make some kind of a special recipe for me, and they're all excited and everything else. That's nice. I like that. Oh, it's so worldly, though. What, what rewards at the judgment seat of Christ is she going to have for making you, uh, you know, whatever recipe? Uh, well, probably none, but uh, she didn't do anything for the Lord in the sense of getting somebody saved or, you know, helping to get the gospel out or whatever, but she followed the scriptures that she's supposed to do things that are worldly to please me as her husband, just as I'm supposed to do worldly things to please her. <laughs> That's what happens when you're married, okay? If you're single, you don't have to think about stuff like that. There are benefits to being single. Again, I was single for 36 years. Verse 35, And this I speak for your own profit, not that I may cast a snare upon you, but for that which is comely, and that ye may attend upon the Lord without distraction. All right? You can attend upon the Lord without distraction if you get certain things taken care of. See? Um, I'm going to show you some other scriptures here. Go to Matthew chapter 19. The book of Matthew in chapter 19. Matthew chapter 19, verse 3 is where we'll start. The Pharisees also came unto him, tempting him and saying unto him, Is it lawful for a man to put away his wife for every cause? And he answered and said unto them, Have ye not read that he which made them male, or made them at the beginning, made them male and female? And said, For this cause shall a man leave father and mother, and shall cleave to his wife, and they twain shall be one flesh. Wherefore they are no more twain, but one flesh. What therefore God hath joined together, let not man put asunder. 
God was the one who planned the thing of a man and a woman coming together in marriage. So, you know, if you're, well, I'm going to do a men going their own way or some other kind of perverted thing, uh, you know, nonsense, selfishness, um, you know, then that's a problem. I'm rejecting the thing of marriage. I don't think that it's good to be married or whatever. Well, that's kind of an issue. You know, it's kind of like the thing of um, the liberty that we have in the sense of, you know, you have liberty to celebrate certain holidays. You have liberty to eat meat or herbs. Let every man be fully persuaded in his own mind. Uh, a woman can wear a physical head covering or she can say, no, my hair is given for a covering. Not a big deal. Well, here you have the thing of single versus marriage is another one where you have liberty. You're not forced to do either one unless you're burning with lust. Okay, then it's better to marry. But it doesn't say it's required to marry. Okay, please understand that. But God is the one who created the thing. He looks and he says, hey, it's not good that the man should be alone. I'll make a helpmate for him. You know, and so he makes Eve to be there to help Adam. And a wife can be a tremendous help to a man, right? For many reasons. I mean, uh, I was, you know, I really had a hard time with forgetting things and whatever else, forgetting people's names. And I thank the Lord for my wife because she, I can say, who is that? We have to, I have to write to this person. Oh, that's, you know, so-and-so. Oh, yeah, okay, you know. <laughs> who was it that I was, said that, you know, about this or that? Oh, that's so-and-so. Oh, hey, here's the, your bills that you're supposed to do for this month. Oh, yeah, I forgot about that. You know, a wife is a great help. So God is the one who created marriage, okay? Um, verse 7. They say unto him, Why did Moses then command to give a writing of divorcement and to put her away? He saith unto them, Moses, because of the hardness of your hearts, suffered you to put away your wives, but from the beginning it was not so. And I say unto you, Whosoever shall put away as his wife, except it be for fornication. She's joined her body to another man, in other words, and shall marry another, committeth adultery, and whoso marrieth her which is put away, doth commit adultery. The very serious warning there. Um, God's very particular about that. His disciples say unto him, If the case of the man be so with his wife, it is not good to marry. If you, uh, you know, have to be careful about your wife not fornicating behind your back, or if you can't com commit fornication, maybe it's best just to stay single, is what his disciples said, in other words. But look at what Jesus says. Verse 11, But he said unto them, All men cannot receive this saying, save they to whom it is given. This isn't for everybody. Again, it's up to you. It's a personal decision. Verse 12, For there are some eunuchs which were so born from their mother's womb, and there are some eunuchs which were made eunuchs of men, and there be eunuchs which have made themselves eunuchs for the kingdom of heaven's sake. He that is able to receive it, let him receive it. Okay, um, was Jesus physically a eunuch, so to speak, in that he didn't get married? Yes, he was. Um, he didn't come here to get married physically. Uh, he came here to die on the cross. But spiritually, he will be married in Revelation chapter 19. Uh, but the whole point is there, you see three different things. There are some men that are, there are some, you know, well, yeah, some men that are born eunuchs. In other words, they don't have any desire for marriage. There are some that are made eunuchs of men. They're taken as slaves and castrated, quite frankly, in the ancient way of doing it. So, you know, there's no problem with those types of guys being around your wife or whatever because they can't do anything. Uh, you don't have to worry about them. And then there's some men that have made themselves eunuchs. That doesn't mean that they physically castrated themselves. It's just they say, hey, you know what? I'm going to stay fo so focused on the things of the Lord that uh, I'm not even going to think about marriage. I'm just going to put that off and just say, well, I can't. Just forget about it. So you say, well, then see, there, there you go. We should make ourselves eunuchs for the kingdom of heaven's sake. Well, uh, one problem there is um, the kingdom of heaven is never said to a Christian in any of the Pauline epistles. Kingdom of God's there, but the kingdom of heaven, which is the physical, visible kingdom on the earth, because the king was there, he was offering the kingdom of heaven. Um, we're not supposed to have kingdom of heaven doctrine for us today. Very important to understand that. So you can't say, well, see, that's for us today. You can, you know, they're supposed to be eunuchs in the body of Christ or something. 
No, um, you don't have to, you're not forced to. Again, all men cannot receive this saying. Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, you know, he's saying the same things. Hey, if you can do this, go ahead. If not, well, better to marry than to burn. It's up to you. It's personal preference. But what do you do if you're single and you would like to get married, but there's just not anybody there? Can you kind of temporarily make yourself a eunuch, so to speak, um, and get away from that stuff? Yes, you can. Are there ways to fight lust? In other words, now that's what we're going to look at next. Romans chapter 7. What to do if you are single and everybody around you is just a frothing at the mouth devil, uh, wicked, <laughs> horrible, crazy whatever that you wouldn't want to get near. And, um, and that goes for women and men, by the way, too. There's some very wicked women and there's some very wicked men out there. And you do well to stay away from them. And don't ever, ever fall for the thing of, well, you know, they'll change after we get married. I've seen that thing so many times. People get burned by that all the time. You know, um, he loves me and he smokes and he has a foul mouth and everything. He calls himself a Christian. I think he might be saved, but he'll change all that when we get, sa when we get married. No, he won't. Um, well, she's a... She does get drunk occasionally and things like that, but I think after we get married, she'll, she'll give up the alcohol. She kind of said that she'd like to, and probably not. You know, be careful about that. Um, Romans chapter 7, beginning in verse 7. What shall we say then? Is the law sin? God forbid. Nay, I had not known sin, but by the law, for I had not known lust. And here's a key. Except the law had said, thou shalt not covet. Huh. Now I'm going to let you in on a little secret here. I'm going to really flesh this out um, till we get through to the end of this study. One of the quickest ways for you to feed lust, sexual lust, is for you to covet things. You say, well, how, that doesn't make sense. So in other words, if I want, a, if I covet some sports car or some really nice house or some, you know, whatever, name it, are you telling me if I covet that, that that's actually going to open up the door for sexual lust? How does that even make sense? Because you're giving occasion to the flesh, you see. It's a backdoor way of doing it. But I remember there were many times as a single guy that I would do that. I would, I would covet something and it would open the door to lust. The whole point is when you crucify your members, when you put down your flesh and say, no, you don't need that, be content with what you have and whatever else, that's going to be a lot harder for sexual lust to come and tempt your flesh. You see, you don't want to think that the two, you know, what a sports car or a, you know, fancy house or this fancy clothes or whatever else. I'm saying ridiculous, you know, crazy clothes or something like that, especially if it's immodest. Um, please understand what I'm saying. I'm not trying to say you should dress like some kind of a monastic Amishman or something like that. Not at all. But what I'm saying is when you covet things that you don't really need, that opens the door to let your flesh, you're giving occasion to the flesh, and you can fall into lust as a result of that. Let's keep reading. Romans chapter 7, verse 8. But sin, taking occasion by the commandment, wrought in me all manner of concupiscence. For without the law, sin was dead. Notice that. Sin, taking occasion by the commandment, wrought in me all manner of concupiscence. All manner of sins and giving into the flesh and the, the desires of the flesh. You let one sin in and the others can come in. All manner of concupiscence. Verse 9. For I was alive without the law once, but when the commandment came, sin revived, and I died. And the commandment which was ordained to life, I found to be unto death. For sin, taking occasion by the commandment, deceived me, and by it slew me. Did you know that sin can deceive you? Well, yeah, I have a, sp a couple sports, you know, car magazines, brother. And I, but I, I, you know, I'm having a problem with uh, pornography or something. I'm having a problem with this lust over here. But, uh, you know, what's a sports car have to do with what's okay? I, I like monster trucks. I always wanted to have a big lifted truck or something or, you know, hey, I've I've been to snowmobiling. I have this or that or whatever women are into. You know, I'm not a woman, so <laughs> sorry about that. 
uh, whatever women get tempted by. The Bible says there, sin taking occasion by the commandment deceived me and by it slew me. You see, the commandments of God that are in here, they're not supposed to be grievous. We're supposed to read the Bible and say, hey, the Bible says to stay away from that and stay away from this. Oh, I'll do that. Why? Because I want to get control over my lust issues. You see? I will set no wicked thing before mine eyes. Well, hey, this movie, it's, it doesn't have any kind of fornication in it or whatever else. Does it have covetousness? Does it, is there profanity? Do they take God's name in vain? Is there a bunch of ridiculous violence and things like that? Well, yeah, but there's no scenes of fornication. You see what I'm saying? You let sin into your life in some other area, it opens the door to other things. It deceives you. Well, I can play with a few little sins over here. No, you can't. Verse 12, Wherefore the law is holy, and the commandment holy, and just, and good. Was then that which is good made death unto me? God forbid. But sin, that it might appear sin, working death in me by that which is good, that sin by the commandment might become exceeding sinful. <laughs> sin by the commandment might become exceeding sinful. You need to take this Bible seriously. If this Bible says, hey, drunkenness is, is a sin, okay, I, I'm, not, I'm staying away from it. I don't want, I don't, you know what, I'm not even, not even going to mess around with alcohol. I don't even want to get near that stuff. You know, there are no righteous people in this book that smoke. All right. You say, well, then nobody's really smoking cigarettes or cigars or pipes or whatever. Yeah, but the point is, where in the Bible does it say that smoking is going to help you out? The smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever. You know, Leviathan, he has, you know, smoke coming out of his nostrils. You would want to look like him, I guess. But, you know, there's a lot of different sins in there that you can look and you can say, hey, the commandments of the Bible are saying no to this and no to that. I better take heed to that. And in doing so, you're cutting off the occasion of your flesh to have to fall into sexual lust. And you can do that as a single person. Hmm. Verse 14. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, sold under sin. For that which I do I allow not, for what I would, that do I not, but what I hate, that do I. When you're sinning. If then I do that which I would not, I consent unto the law that it is good. Now then it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. For to will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good I find not. For the good that I would, I do not, but the evil which I would not, that I do. Now if I do that I would not, it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. Okay, he's going into the whole thing, <coughs> excuse me, of, he's just simply explaining you can't just get to a point where your flesh, you can say, oh, you know, I'm, I'm okay. My flesh and, and my spirit and my soul, we all just kind of get along. Or whatever. No, you have to put your flesh down. You have to understand that your flesh is prone to sin. All right? You have to go through the commandments of God and say, you know what? These things are actually unto life. It's not, a, it's not some kind of, oh, it's a killjoy. I can't do this and I can't do that. And, oh, you know. I like playing my video games where I go around killing people and stealing cars and I like that stuff and I like to, you know, all the wicked things that you can do with your life. Um, if you're going to do that stuff, uh, it's going to lead to other sins happening. That's the whole point of this study. You have to be careful. Verse 21, I find then a law that when I would do good, evil is present with me. For I delight in the law of God after the inward man. It's a delight to follow the Word of God. It is. It isn't some kind of a thing, you know, where religious cults go off, is they force it without explaining it. That's not right. That's a problem. Um, you have to wear this special thing, and the, the, the boys, you know, have to sit on this side of the church, and the girls over on that side, and you can't look at it, over at each other. You're not allowed to hold hands and whatever. Well, you're just making the system that they're going to want to do that wicked stuff. That's all that you're doing. <laughs> they aren't going to say, oh, hey, this is good stuff. This is really spiritual and whatever. No, you're just making all that more fascinating and whatever else. You know, the, the youths of the Amish cult, you know, when Rumspringa comes along, they're in the, the barns fornicating. Um, 
you know, having orgies and things like that, to be quite frank. Uh, my father, back in the 1950s, as a teenager, he had a friend that was a Amish boy that left the Amish cult. And he said, hey, you know, I hear there's a hoedown. They used to call them hoedowns. And they went over and he said they went in and he said they were doing drugs, alcohol, and they were fornicating all throughout the barn. Different couples. In the 1950s, the Amish, you know. Why? Because they have standards forced on them, but they're not explaining why. It's just this rigid law, you will not, you will not. That's not what the Bible's talking about. The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. It's a beautiful thing. You say, okay, I understand here. God's not trying to take my fun away of getting drunk. Getting drunk, if I do it enough in life, it causes cirrhosis of the liver. You know, you get drunk, it's expensive. You wake up the next morning with a hangover. You do stupid things when you're drunk. You make a fool out of yourself. Hmm, maybe God's trying to warn me about that. See? And you start to say, yeah, all right, I see that. Okay, I'm staying away from it. And you get down through all the other list of things, sins that are condemned in the scriptures. And you realize, wow, it's the instructions of a loving father to his child. Stay away from this stuff. It's not rigid rules of some, you know, horrible religious system or something. That's what you have to understand. That's why you delight in the law of God after the inward man. You delight in it. But you realize that your sinful flesh is going to want to get into that stuff. And if you open the door to covetousness, it can let, let lust come in with it. You see what I'm saying? Verse 23, But I see another law in my members, warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin which is in my members. O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then with the mind I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh the law of sin. A lot to say right there. There's a war. You read about it in Galatians chapter 5. You have to fight. You have to crucify the flesh. You don't go into war and say, well, you know, here comes a, a bad guy. I'm just going to kind of, uh, you know, shoot him in the knee or something like that and then put a tourniquet around him and go on to the next, you know, guy that I can wound, give him a flesh wound or something. You have to kill the guy in war, okay? Enemy soldier coming over there or back, you know, over this way or something like that. Pull your gun out and take care of the situation. Well, that's the way it is with yourself, Right? I know that I have a problem with lust as a single man, as a single woman, for you out there. Then I have to crucify my flesh. I have to put my flesh down. I don't want to sin before God. I don't want to have to stand before him and be guilty someday and say, I'm sorry, Lord. And he says, well, you're one of my children, but boy, you messed up down there. <laughs> it's a terrible thing. And I'll tell you right now, the more pornography you look at, the more it scars your brain. Because pornography is training you to mentally undress everybody that you see out in public. That's what pornography is. Turn you into just somebody that just can't even think pure thoughts anymore. And when you look at it for years and years and years, you'll struggle with it. Um, I am a victim of pornography. I did it according to my own free will. But my point is, for years I looked at that garbage going over to secular kids' houses. Christian parents, keep your children away from secular children, okay? If you, oh, my neighbor, they're, they're good people. They're not saved, but, you know, I, my children and their children, they get along. Keep them away from them. Keep them separate because I can guarantee you that those secular children, if they have access to pornography, they will show your children. That's what happened to me. My parents, you know, were very much against pornography, but there were secular children in the area that my siblings hung out with and they would get pornography from them. And I remember being just a little boy, I didn't even understand what certain body parts were yet, you know, on a woman. And I remember my brother came and said, hey, you know, look what Eddie uh, Kanua down the road. And he comes, hey, look, look what I got from Eddie Kanua. And you know, shows me this magazine. I'm, what, what, what is that? But, uh, boy, it let something in me. Huh, you know, what else do you have there? Mm hmm? And for years and years and years, I looked at that filthy garbage. 
magazines and then videos rented from video stores and then the internet came along and then you know i go way back yeah but uh then the internet came along and there's all the access to the porn on online making records of all the stuff i've ever looked at foolish and uh you say well uh do you have any scars from that mentally yes i do it's called uh, nightmares almost every night of my life horrible terrible nightmares so um uh, Somebody can drink for years and years and ruin their liver or they have somebody smokes for years and years and they have emphysema or some other type of thing like that. Um, I have mental scars and they'll always be there until the day I go to be with Jesus Christ. That's why I warn people about pornography. There's no such thing as innocent pornography viewing and it doesn't hurt if you just look or whatever. Yes, it does. It destroys your mind. And you keep up with it. Pornography is a, is a dark pit it starts out with a soft core, and then it gets worse and worse and worse. And at the bottom of that pit, you start getting into bestiality and child pornography and whatever else. And praise Lord, I never got into that stuff. But there were websites that they had that stuff, access to it, and whatever you had to go, and you had to do this and sign. And I'd look at and I'd see the links to it. And I'd, oh, man, what in the world? Okay. And I started getting scared after a while because I could see where things were going. You have to get weirder and weirder to get the thrill that you once got before because it's perversion you see you get married you can have intimacy with the same woman for your whole life and everything's fine you don't have to get weirder and weirder and things like that because you see marriage is ordained of god pornography is not but i can tell you again speaking from experience lusting came from other sins. There were times that I, I really had the victory and I was, uh, man, I, I'm not looking at pornography anymore. I'm not lusting after all this stuff. And you know what? Just forget it. Really doing work for the Lord and, and things. And all of a sudden I'd start coveting something. I'd open the door to sin. Come on in. Come on into my life. Boom, came back the lust. And I'd fall and get messed up again. And, oh Lord, I'm sorry. I can't believe I did that terrible. 1 Corinthians chapter 10. First Corinthians chapter 10 verses 1 through 14. Moreover, brethren, I would not that ye should be ignorant how that all our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea and were all baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea and did all eat the same spiritual meat. And did all drink the same spiritual drink, for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. But with many of them God was not well pleased, for they were overthrown in the wilderness. Now these things were our examples to the intent we should not lust after evil fornication. No, lust after evil things, as they also lusted. Huh. Neither be ye idolaters, as were some of them, as it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. Neither let us commit fornication, as some of them, as some of them committed and fell in one day three and twenty thousand. Neither let us tempt Christ, as some of them also tempted and were destroyed of serpents. Neither murmur ye, as some of them also murmured and were destroyed of the destroyer. I'm reading too, okay. Now all these things happen unto them for in samples, and they are written for our admonition, remember that, upon whom the ends of the world are come. Wherefore let him that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fall. There hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that ye are able, but will with the temptation also make a way to escape, that ye may be able to bear it. Wherefore, my dearly beloved, flee from idolatry. You can make idols out of a whole lot of different things. Some little, you know, you think idol, you think of this little fat statue of Buddha, you know, whatever, sitting there, you know, there's, you know, that's an idol. Uh, no, I mean, it is, but there's a lot of other idols. You don't have to have a physical thing sitting there on your shelf, but you can have posters. You can have things in your mind, things that you're constantly looking up, screen savers and whatever on your computer, some hot sports car or Whatever, doesn't have to be a hot girl or whatever. It can be a sports car. It could be all kinds of different things. 
things that you're coveting after that are opening the door for other issues. But let's look at a couple of things here, okay? There's a big list, actually, in this passage that we just read there, 1 Corinthians 10, verses 1 through 14. What do we see? Number one, we see lust after evil things. It doesn't say lust after good things. Another little example there. You know, the Bible says, covet earnestly the best gifts. Okay, in 1 Corinthians chapter uh, 12, it talks about that. Then chapter 13 goes into the thing of charity. We're to covet good things, covet things of the Lord. You hear somebody that can quote a whole, you know, chapter of scripture, you say, wow, I wish I could do that. Somebody who can sing hymns, you know, from memory. Hey, that's really neat. I wish I could do that. Covet those things. That feeds the spirit, not the flesh important to do there. But the Bible condemns in this passage, lusting after evil things. Number two, idolatry. Flee idolatry. The Bible also says flee what? Fornication. Hmm, little connection there. Idolatry leads to lust. Remember that. Third, um, committing fornication. The Bible talks about neither, neither let us commit fornication um, or what about being entertained by it? Romans chapter 2. Let's turn there real quick. Keep your finger in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Go, but go to Romans chapter 2. Romans chapter 2. Verses 1 through 3 says here, Therefore thou art inexcusable, O man, whosoever thou art that judgest, for wherein thou judgest another, thou condemnest thyself, for thou that judgest doest the same things. Hypocritical judgment, which is, you know, you have the whole thing of judge not lest ye be judged, or whatever, or judge not that ye be not judged, is actually how the Bible says it. Lest ye be judged is a Metallica song. <laughs> but uh, I have a whole study on that. Um, you know, one of the common sayings of lost people, C-S-O-L-P studies, but, uh, you know, hypocritical judgment is condemned there in verse 1. But look at verse 2. But we are sure that the judgment of God is according to truth against them which commit such things. And thinkest thou this, O man, that judgest them which do such things, and doest the same, that thou shalt escape the judgment of God? Okay. Um, okay, verse 32 of chapter 1 is what I was, the other part I was thinking of there. Um, Romans chapter 1, verse 32 who knowing the judgment of God that they which commit such things are worthy of death, not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. So that condemns, uh, you go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 10, that condemns not only the sin, but if you're having pleasure in them that do them. Well, I just watch a movie. I'm not actually fornicating. I'm just, you know, watching it or something in some Hollywood movie or whatever. Not even full-scale pornography. I'm just talking Hollywood movies where they're, you know, not even showing the actual act, but it's being portrayed. You're having pleasure in them that do them. If you are being sexually aroused by that movie, then you are having pleasure in the sins of fornication. You better think about that. It's very important. Another thing that uh, 1 Corinthians 10, 1 through 14 condemns is um, murmuring. Let's look about that. Verse 10. 1 Corinthians 10, verse 10. Neither murmur ye, as some of them also murmured, and were destroyed of the destroyer. You start to murmur against the Lord. That's opening the door for sin. Hmm. You know, I don't understand why God would have done this. I don't really understand. You know, maybe the Bible's not even true. I don't I know. Mean, maybe, you know. Be careful. You know, I kind of miss uh, going to that place. I used to go there with my friends, and boy, my friends have even departed from me. And I'd, this Christianity stuff, I don't really careful. Don't murmur against the Lord. It's important to remember that. Another thing, um, verse or number five, pride in verse tw 12 can lead to a fall into lust. Let's look about that. Uh, 1 Corinthians 10 and verse 12. Um, Wherefore let him that thinketh he take, he standeth take heed lest he fall. <laughs> oh boy. Uh, church building pastors. And even, you know, I'm not just ripping on church buildings, but, you know, anybody out there, any man out there, you know, I've seen guys, even ones that are married, 
and they'll get this prideful thing. I'm the pastor, the reverend, so-and-so, and I'm somebody else, and I'm a great theologian and one of the greatest preachers or whatever else. Well, there's a pretty young girl. You know, she's. I can say that she's attractive, okay? It's not a problem. She came into my church here, or, or you know, she's working at the store, and she's kind of friendly to me. And th She's an attractive young woman, okay? That's all I'm saying, and, you know. Okay, we do talk, and I mean, we're getting along very nice and, and things. And she offered to help at, you know, after hours in my study. And, and you know, uh, you know, she's going to be my secretary now. And, you know, okay, she's going to be coming with me on this mission thing that I need to go, whatever, so she can take notes. And, <laughs> yeah, well, I'll never fall because I take my strong stands. And, uh, no, the Bible says flee fornication. Okay, it's good for a man not to touch a woman. I know of uh, brethren when get together and things, and they don't even allow shaking of hands. They say, no, let's just, you know, stay away from that. You shouldn't be touching. Let's not do a lot of hugging and kissing and, you know, on the face and all. Just, uh, yeah, you're better off just, you know, yeah, let's not do that. I think there's some wisdom to that. You say, you're afraid of your flesh falling, Brian? If I let it go, yes. Yeah. Um, if I messed around, I don't trust myself. See, after all you've done and uh, all the videos and all the studies and everything, yeah. Mm -hmm. I have to be careful that I don't fall. I have a much easier time now that I'm married. Um, I have a wife that I love very much. Um, all the things that go along with marriage, but uh, I'm not invincible. You have to not let your pride get the best of you. And think that, oh, I won't fall anymore. Um, yes, you can and yes, you will if you're not careful. And um, verse uh, 13, 1 Corinthians 10, 13 is the final point I wanted to make from this passage. There hath no temptation taken you but such as is common to man, but God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that ye are able, but will with the temptation also make a way to escape that ye may be able to bear it. Um, I preached a sermon many years ago, uh, The Pornography Epidemic. It's one of my most viewed videos, which says a lot about the body of Christ. Uh, you know, pornography is a major problem, in other words. It was a big problem way back then, um, well over 10 years ago. And uh, it's a bigger problem now. And um, But I remember I said one of the things in there, I said, if you have a real problem with pornography, you might have to get rid of your computer, get rid of the Internet access. If it's that big of a problem, you might have to take some radical steps. You say, well, I, I just, I don't know. Could it be that that's the way God is providing out for you? Hmm. Maybe you should go to a public library and download my sermons or other sermons and things like that if you want to hear preaching. If you're having a problem having a personal computer, you're a single guy, single woman, and you say, every time I get on the computer, I'm listening to studies, I'm doing great. And I start checking out some things while I'm, you know, listening to a study. I start playing some video games and, oh, there's that advertisement again. Oh, man. Oh, there's that advertisement. And after a while, okay, maybe I'll just click that link. There. Maybe God's way of you getting out of temptation is for you to get away from the Internet. If it's that bad. Something to think about. You say, not me, brother. I don't have a problem with clicking on any dirty links or whatever else. I go and I look at muscle cars. Um, not me. I go over and I check out the newest iPhones and the newest this and that and whatever else. Um, I have a thing for jewelry. Some young lady out there. I have a thing I like, you know, the really nice jewelry and everything. I look at that stuff while I'm listening to a sermon. You forming an idol? You better be careful. Oh, no, not me, brother. I'm, I'm really, I have victory over my lust and everything else. You might fall. Galatians chapter 5. Galatians chapter 5. 
verse 16 through 26. This I say then, walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusteth against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary the one to the other, so that ye cannot do the things that ye would. Do you ever get to the end of a, a YouTube um, day or something where you're watching a whole bunch of videos on YouTube, and you get to the end and you realize, you know, that there wasn't a whole lot of that that was really about the Lord. And you just feel like pond scum or, you know, dirt or something where you just think, well, I just wasted a whole day of my life watching a bunch of useless, stupid nonsense. <laughs> Why? Um, well, because the Spirit actually also lusts against the flesh. The Spirit has lust. Okay? <laughs> I mean, look what it says there. Um, For the flesh lusteth against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. Lusteth is the word there. The Spirit's against the flesh. The Spirit says, I want you to spend a huge amount of time in the Word. I want you to listen and sing hymns, not just listen to hymns. I want you to sing hymns. The Holy Spirit, I, boy, I, I just would love to hear that from you. Give in to that lust, okay? Verse 18, But if ye be led of the Spirit, ye are not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, Variants, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like, of the which I tell you before, as I have also told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. You see, what's written to lost people. See, they don't inherit the kingdom of God. Uh, no, actually, if you read the context of it here, the kingdom of God is spiritual fellowship. You can read about that over in the book of Romans. Um, peace and joy and righteousness in the Holy Ghost, in other words. Uh, that's what it's talking about. You can get involved in all that stuff as a Christian. Why? Because you're allowing doors of sin to open and to corrupt the whole body. It's a problem. Verse 22. Here's what you should covet. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. And how do you get that stuff? And they that are Christ have crucified the flesh. War. You fight yourself with the affections and lusts. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Let us not be desirous of vain glory, provoking one another, envying one another. That's the advice there. Well, yeah, I don't know if I, I think I have some other ways. First uh, John chapter 2. First John chapter 2. I know that there's a lot of viewers out there that are single. Some of you are single, never married. Some of you are single, formerly married. And um, I understand. It's rather rough sometimes to be single. You get to an age where you don't really think much about, you know, um, intimacy. Well, okay. You don't have any kind of a need there or whatever else. Or you say, well, the man I was married to, the woman I was married to, depending on what you are, um, they were the, the only per person I'd ever want to be married to, and so I don't have any desire for marriage from this day forward. Okay, well, that's fine. Um, but you can fall into other sins if you start to covet and you start to lust after evil things. So we all have to be careful. First John chapter 2. Um, Verse 15 through 17. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world passeth away, and the lust thereof. But he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. Don't be worldly in the sense of uh, lusting after it and coveting, it, coveting after it and whatever. Um, you have to, if you're married, you have to think about the things of the world, how you may please your wife. That's scripture. A woman has to think about the things of the world, how she may please her husband. That's scripture. But if you're single, um, you have to try to work hard against being worldly. You have to say, no, I'm not going to do that. So, let me 
see if I have anything else there on the notes. No, I don't. Um, so that's going to be it for this study. Um, my dog's over here. I don't know if you can hear him or not. Uh, he's ripping all kinds of stuff up, digging a hole. <laughs> um, he doesn't think much about it. Uh, just a little creature that loves to be out in nature and have a good time. And um, there's some instruction there <laughs> in, in righteousness, so to speak. Uh, not thinking about a lot of stuff. He doesn't worry about sports cars or big houses or fancy clothing or whatever else. He thinks about food and sleeping and uh, not much else for him. But a uh, <laughs> little interesting side note there. But um, just be encouraged, brethren, if you are single, um, single guy, single girl, uh, there are ways that you can fight lust. And if you're struggling with the thing of pornography, um, you don't have to just say, well, you know, I'm, I burn with lust, therefore I have to be married. Well, it's better for you to be married than to burn. But it doesn't say it's required for you to be married. And there are ways that you can stay single and fight that lust. It is definitely there. Now, you don't have to make yourself a eunuch, right? That's not scripturally pointed doctrinally at us. But you can say... There's a formula there that if I fight certain sins, covetousness being one of the big ones, I can, as a result, keep lust down. So, um, please do take heed to what I'm saying because you can really mess your life up if you get into the pornography thing and, and even if it goes to the point where you're fornicating and whatever else, uh, that's a real problem. And I just want to say one other thing when it comes to um, proper biblical marriage is a covenant or a coverture. There are no state marriage licenses in the, in the New Testament. You don't go to the government, secular government, and say, can we be married? Uh, marriage is something that God institutes, not secular government. Secular government is there to punish evildoers and to you know, enforce laws that are in line with Scripture. Um, there's nothing there about marriage. So the government has no right to get into, the secular government has no right to get into marriage at all. But uh, if you decide that you're going to have a marriage coverture, understand what you're getting yourself into. It isn't some kind of a thing, oh yeah, we just, you know, went together and we, you know, had the marriage bed and now we're officially married and that's all that there is to it. No, uh, you're making a commitment and you make it before God and man. And then you have witnesses, you're signing the co coverture or the covenant, whatever you have. And there's a little bit of difference between the two, but that's I covered that in another study. Um, but what you're doing is you're pledging to stay together. You are pledging to say, I am going to be her spiritual covering. That's what a coverture is more pointed that way. A uh, covenant's a little bit more of a, we're just kind of making an agreement between God and men, or between each other and before God and man, say it that way. But a curvature is a lot more spiritually binding. It's more of the, I am taking um, the spiritual headship of her father and I am placing it now upon myself and I am now her provider spiritually and physically. That's why I believe in spiritual or marriage curvatures. Um, but it's not some kind of thing because I've had a couple of people, wicked little people, and they come along and they say, oh, brother, I want to do a marriage curvature. What do we need to do? And I tell them the process and the whole thing. And... Um, I hear a month later or whatever, yeah, it didn't work out. You know, we, just, we went to some other place here and we fornicated, you know, essentially. Or we, we came together as husband and wife, but then it didn't work out. Then you didn't have a coverture. That's fornication, okay? A marriage coverture works out and you don't split up. Okay, that's one of the reasons why marriage covertures are not very popular now because you can't get divorced, right? Uh, you are truly together until death. So... Um, or fornication, and, and in which case, if you know you have a marriage coverture and one of the members fornicates with somebody else, their life is going to be ruined from that point on. So, um, but I just wanted to say that don't try to use the marriage coverture thing as an excuse to go out and fornicate. You do that, you are going to be judged harshly by God. All right. Um, so, that is going to be it, and I thank you out there. 
to all those who support the ministry, to those who pray for the ministry. I have a few more studies to do today. Um, so I need to get those done. So uh, we will see you in the next study. Thank you very much for watching. King James Video Ministries has been faithfully preaching and teaching from God's Word since 2008. Our YouTube channel has never been monetized and we do not accept money from the lost world because this would violate the scriptures. King James Video Ministries is supported by saved brethren in accordance with 1 Timothy chapter 5, verses 17 through 18. If you have been blessed by our videos, we would ask that you prayerfully consider supporting this ministry financially. You can donate online by visiting www.kingjamesvideoministries.com or by sending a check or money order to King James Video Ministries, P.O. Box 214, Patton, Maine, 04765. Thank you to all who donate to this ministry, and we pray for the Lord's blessing in your lives.